Heavenly Father, we have come here this morning to worship you, to glorify you, to indeed lift you up. And as we come to your word, Lord God, I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open to receive what you want to say to us. That we will hear you speaking to us. Lord, I pray for myself, Lord God, that what I've prepared, Lord God, if there's anything that is not what you want to say, you just remove it from my remembrance. Make it disappear. And if you want it to go in a completely different direction, Lord God, let your will be done as well. Have your way. It's always about you, Lord Jesus, not about us, but about you. We're here for you, Lord God. We desire to hear you. Oh, Holy Spirit, we just welcome you and thank you for being present this morning. We pray for your continuing Holy Spirit leading in your mighty name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I heard this, what I was going to do today, and then I kind of... Um, changed my mind again then went back to it again and um thought i had it all done last night and then this morning i ended up kind of rewriting the focus <laughs> um quite a bit and i'm i'm just really going to see what god does um i'm not one that believes you gotta you gotta say something you know gotta preach if you don't need god doesn't want us to do that so i'm just gonna be led by the spirit and if i end up stopping then it means that's what god wants us to do and i just pray lord that you just pray that you will um can embrace that and just go wherever God um, is leading us. Um, if anyone does feel God is saying something to them, please, um, you know, if you're on mute, unmute yourself and just speak up. Um, it, it's quite easy when we're using Zoom, I think, to get caught up in doing, you know, to sort of being a bit passive. Um, and that's not what, you know, God wants us to be. We should be actively worshipping him just because we're doing it in our own homes doesn't mean God doesn't want us to be, um, you know, activated to be what he wants us to be and to do what he wants us to, to do. And when he speaks to us individually, then, you know, we need to be able, you know, and something that's especially to encourage the body, we need to do that as well. So what I was going to be talking about, and as I say, um, I'll see where this moves and it might be, I shift again, is going to be, it was in Thessalonians and, um, We'll do, the, we'll do the reading and then I'll just see how I feel what God is saying and if it needs to shift from what I felt God was saying before. Um, I'm just going to be led by him this morning, just really, because I just kind of feel, I just feel that even though we're on Zoom, God wants to do something this morning with us and I don't know what that is. And so I don't want to get in the way by preaching if that's not what he wants. So it's really, I'm kind of saying, Lord, let your will be done this morning. Do what you need to do and just be led by him. Um, and just sort of yeah and then um, I might need to get a tissue and <laughs> so um, it, can someone read 1 Thessalonians 4 um, verses 1 to 12 please I can read it um, 1 Thessalonians 4 1 to 12 yeah, yeah living, to, living to please God as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and, in this, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. 
For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught to God, by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent upon anybody. You're on mute, Alison. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> so what I wanted to talk, or what I was thinking I was going to be talking about this morning was Christian holiness. Um, and we have kind of been going through, which as I said before, is quite unusual for me, a, a book in this way, you know, and you know, over a number of times that I have spoken, I've kind of stuck in one Thessalonians. I've been kind of, I say stuck, but I don't know, in a negative way. It's just where sometimes God leads you to certain things. Um, and that's where I feel God has been talking, is just walking us through. And I talked before about in one Thessalonians, certainly the first three chapters are all about the gathered church, the church together. And the last time we met, I was talking about the fact that we were separate, like Paul was separate from Thessalonians, um, but it was still about the gathered church, what we do together. And moving into sort of chapters, in chapter four and five, the latter part of this letter, is really more about how we are as the scattered church. Um, and in this passage, um, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is talking about a lifestyle um, that we need to lead. Um, and it's a holiness lifestyle. And that doesn't always sound good to people. People don't like really hearing about that message. It's not, it, people aren't comfortable with it. But, and in some, in, in some um, translations, it says the word walk or, you know, so how we're walking. In others, it's about the word about, you know, li you know like li um, living, it's about living. But the image of walking is really a useful way for us to think about um, what he's trying to get across in this lifestyle message of Paul, because it gives you the idea about making progress. You know, there's a series of steps, one after another, that's going in a certain direction. And good walking um, is steady. It's not unbalanced. It's a steady walk. And there's a consistency to it when you're doing good, robust walking sort of thing. And that's what the Christian life should be like. It should be that we're, you know, we've got some kind of consistency in moving forward and living that lifestyle that God is calling us to live. In, if you move on, if, in looking at going back to um, in verse three um, and onwards, he's really, you know, there's a number of things that he's addressing there about holiness. He looks at the area of sex, where the exhortations are to avoid sexual immorality, and it's in a context where there was a lot of, um, um, a variety of sex before and outside of marriage. Probably should have given a health warning. Um, I'm gonna be talking a bit about sex this morning. Um, and sometimes we're afraid to talk about it in church, but I was just recently, I've been, I was, I was listening to something and it's like, well, we've got to remember God created it. So we shouldn't be ashamed to talk about it or be embarrassed to talk about it in church. And if we don't do it, then we can't, ex we can't, we, we, we can't then get frustrated with the world when we're saying that they're not living how God wants the world to live because we run away from it. And so it's important that we are, we are not afraid to do that and that we actually talk about it um, in, the, in the right way in, in church and not shy away from it. There's so many young people, I, um, when I used to be um, doing um, um, youth work, um, who would be, you know, would say, oh, if you said the word, go, oh, you shouldn't, we can't talk about that, we're in church. And I began, why not? <laughs> and it's that image and it, and but actually it's in it's in there because it's created by God and so sometimes people you know you ministers don't want to talk about this or if they do it they do it in such a negative way that actually it just encourages that negative concept and mindset about it so um we are talking about it and I know um I'd already flagged to Becca so I know Natasha's not in the room of course so that's okay as well but um it's, it's really about, the, this, what we're talking about, he's talking about sex before and outside of marriage, which was tolerated at that time when Thessalonians was written. 
But he's also talking about, you know, the second thing he's talking about is controlling our bodies. And that can be in all different ways, but it was really about, in, in relate, this was really specifically in relation um, to, to sex, but it does other things as well, but also honoring others. Because how we are of other people, how we interact with other people on that level as well, he was challenging that in a sense. And he was saying we shouldn't be exploiting others, but looking out for their well being. And the fourth thing he talked about was really the fear of God. And so that we, you know, by, you know, if we don't actually fear God um, and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, then he was questioning that. And this is really what was embodied in the whole concept of holiness that he was talking about. Um, and when we think about it, the preaching of the gospel in, in this particular passage, there is implications for sexual conduct. That's part of it. And it's a context where um, it, they were also talking about where people were actually sponging off of other members. So if they were actually going and trying to get into what the, they would call patrons in that time period, in that time um, back in um, when this was written, where they were having, they were trying to get relationships where they could get things, where someone of a lower status was trying to attach to someone of a higher status to get a benefit from them. They wanted to get some kind of connection um, with them. So really Paul was challenging what was going on at, in life at that time point. He wasn't running away from it. He was kind of saying, hey, these are things we've got to be talking about as well. Um, and so he raised these things as well with them and he wasn't afraid or hid from it. And we can't be either. Um, and so that's what he was kind of trying to get to when he was talking to them. <clears throat> and so just for, for the Thessalonians and just for us as well, we are all called to live faithfully, not just in the home or when we're at church, but also when we're out there in the public sphere, when we're out there working, when we're with our colleagues, um, you know, our employees, managers, associates, whoever we're in contact with, he was saying we need to also then as well think about the lifestyle that we're living. That holiness lifestyle is just as important then, at, you know, at that time point as well. Um, and what he didn't mean um, really is that not that we should be kind of hiding away or withdrawing. To be holy does not mean withdrawing from the world, where sometimes we've made the mistake of thinking that, um, that we need to be separate in that sense, but we just need to participate in a new and different way. And according to this passage, it's a way which flows out of seeking a life that wants to please God in the context of love for our fellow believers, but also our missional concern for the wider world. And this is the scattered bit. So what we do, how we think is all part of how we're going to be thinking about the, the wider world, how we think about each other, but also about our concerns for the wider world and for them coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And for me, there's really two important threads that come through this passage. And one of those elements is a love for God. And the second one is a love for our neighbor. And Paul really lays down instructions to the Thessalonians to, in, in verses in, in the first part of that passage. We should be doing things in order to please God. And these were instructions which reflected God's will as well. He says that in, in verse three. So they were taught by God in verse nine, it says. And in told there's about eight times in all in this passage where God or Jesus is mentioned as to why he's exhorting them to this thing, to this, this um, lifestyle. And all of these, instru these instructions really should be shaping our relationships within and outside our Christian community. They are told not to, um, you know, not to, to, not to wrong or take advantage of other people in verse six, um, but to love each other in verse nine and to live and work in a way that really wins the respect of outsiders. So, whether it's in a sexual relationship or in our working lives, the love of God and the love of neighbor is like what um, John Piper says, it's like two hedges on the side of a dimly lit road. And really it provides the safest and best principles for navigating our Christian walk and witness to others. If we think about God and our love for him, and we think about our neighbor and our love for our neighbor, then that should be making us be the greatest witnesses we can be for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know some of you are still thinking, well, okay, I'm not really sure where you're going with this, but <laughs> bear with me. Um, and in verse three, it talks about that will of God for our, sanctify our sanctify sanctification that we abstain from immorality. That's what it says. Now, when Paul delivers instructions to them, he does it through the Lord Jesus. What they, and so what they hear is what they're hearing is from the will of God. 
It's God's word and God's will. This wasn't just Paul being difficult. This was an inspired word from God that he was giving them, that he was instructing them how to live. And his will was really for them to be sanctified. And sanctification is that process of, of becoming holy. That's what it's about. And Paul had this in mind um, by holiness. He, he was thinking back, we, we think back to Thessalonians um, chapter 3, um, 1, one three. Um, it says, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all men, as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God. So if abounding in love is the means by which our hearts are established in holiness, then love must be the thing that Paul has in mind when he's encouraging them to make progress in holiness or sanctification. That's what he's thinking about. And this, when you think about applying of the, the love in this context of the, of the um, and it's, it's, it puts in relation to abstaining from sexual immorality. Or, and so he's saying we need to not be promiscuous. That's what he's saying. It's not compatible. He says if you're abounding in love, you can't be doing that because you'll be thinking about God and you'll be doing it in the right context and you want to do what's going to honour God as well and honour your brothers and sisters. In the Revised Standard Version, at verse 4, it says, you know, you need to learn to control your own body. And you think that if we do that, we're actually saying, God, I want you, to, what, it really, what it really means is, God, I want you to take control. I want to be led by your spirit in everything that I do. And that's what, and that sounds hard sometimes. We sort of think, well, I'm trying. And in our own strength, we cannot do it. But Paul wants us to get really practical um, about holiness. And it can be practical. It sounds in our head, we can't be. It sounds impossible. And it is impossible on our own, in our, on, in our own strength. But the key, one of the key things that help, will help us to get to that place is knowing God. And I mean really knowing God. That's how we're going to get there. To really understand holiness and what that means is that we need to know God. And this means we need to spend time in his word, talking to him, getting to know his character. Nothing but the knowledge of God as the Holy One will make us holy. And how are we able to obtain that knowledge of God except in the inner chamber, our private place of prayer? It is a thing utterly imposs impossible unless we take time and allow the holiness of God to shine on us. Andrew Murray, a South African writer from the last century, wrote that. Nothing but the knowledge of God as the Holy One will make us holy. And it's so true. Unless we know, really know who God is, understand him, start to spend time with him and understand his character and who he is, what makes him tick, so to speak. That's when we can start to move into the practical side of being truly holy as he wants us to be. In verse five of, of this chapter, Paul's really implying that the key to conquering sexual temptation is to know God. Don't give rein to your passions like Gentiles who don't know God is what it says. And Charles Coulson, again, about this, this concept of the knowing of God, he hit a dry sponge like, um, a while back. And one of his friends, he said, suggested that he listened to some lectures by um, a minister called R.C. Sproul and on, on the holiness of God. And he, and he said, all he knew about Sproul was that he was a theologian, so he wasn't really enthusiastic. He thought, oh gosh, this is going to be really bogging me down in theology. And so he thought, um, you know, people that, you know, his, in his mind, people um, that were into theology were, you know, for those that had time to study and were locked in ivory towers, far from the battlefields of what was really going on with human needs and emotions. But his friend kept urging him, saying, you need to, you need to, you just need to, um, you know, sort of listen to some of those lectures. So in the end, he did. And by the end of the sixth lecture, he said he was on my knees, deep in prayer, in awe of God's absolute holiness. He said it was a life-changing experience as I gained a completely new understanding of the holy God I believe in and worship. Often people say they know God, but do they really know God? really know God, know his heart and his character. And we can't if we're not prepared to spend time with him. We can't if we're not prepared to really meditate on his Lord. Not just read his word and say, I've done my chapter for today, 
but really meditate on it, chew on the word and say, what are you saying to me? What did it mean then? What does it mean for me now? Really chew on the word of God. When we've done that, and that's when God will start to speak to us and to reveal to us what he's trying to share with us and get us to know so that we can start to change. And that's what God wants. He wants to touch every part of our life. And that's what would help us to become living that practical, holy life that he's calling for us all to do. When we do that, when we get to know him and who he is for what he is, that's what he's won. And that's my desire, that we all come to know God in spirit and in truth, the true living God. Every part of God's word, is in, it, it, the Bible is inspired by God. We know that, we believe that. Sometimes it's not comfortable, but it's actually, what that's the truth though. It's inspired by God and it's there for a reason. And at different times, that parts of those scripture might speak to us into, our certain, into certain situations and God will remind us about it or bring it to us in a new way. Things that we've read before that we didn't really understand, it'll come to us. The other thing that is, as I say, is really important that Paul is trying to get across is this, is this gift of God that we have to be practically holy. It's not from us, it's not human achievement that does it, but it's really a gift from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wants for us. Now, I know that um, it's sometimes it's, it's hard and think about it, but he's saying to, but what he's saying, it starts off by saying, the Lord will make you increase and abound in love. It starts off from that point of love. And God will give us, will sanctify us. So it's not actually us doing it in ourselves in a sense, it's God doing it for us. And it's us just being open to him, his spirit leading and guiding us, and then he will do it for us. He does not do, he does not, um, do it apart from his word though. So we need God's word. And Paul, when he's, when he's, he's speaking to them, he, he prays in um, Thessalonians 3 that we did looked at last time. And then he goes into this. So he links it back to God the whole time. And he commands them not to transgress or to wrong a brother. He said, you know, and that's what he says. And in John 17, it says, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. And that is what sanctifies. That is what is going to make us holy. <clears throat> But if we reject this, um, I, I remember I've, I've, one of those, I've read a lot of commentaries um, over this um, while I've been preparing for this. Um, and one of the things that, was, um, that I read was, um, I think it was John Piper, well, was it John Piper's commentary? I think it was, um, was really about um, what he said is that if we reject the exhortation to sexual purity, then we're actually rejecting God. And it's amazing how many Christians think that the day-to-day -day choices that they, they make have no bearing on their relation, relation to God, their relationship to God. If we say something nasty to someone or we have a sharp word to a loved one, we're rebelling against the Holy Spirit. That sounds quite harsh, but that's what it is. If we break the speed limit, and I'm talking to myself here, then actually it's a failure to trust God to get us where we need to go. Because why is there a need to speed? All these things, lust is an insult to the, sa the, the, the fact that fellowship with God is all satisfying. Holding a grudge cuts one off from the forgiveness of God. All the joys of life can either be exalted by a spirit of gratitude and worship towards God or be debased to idolatry by ignoring the relationship with God. And that's what we've got to think about. All these things, is this honouring to God? Is this in God in line with God's character? My desire is for us to be a people that has a God-saturated experience of life, that all aspects of our life is saturated by God. That's my desire. I want it for you and I want it for me. Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I want every part of your life to know that you know that God is there with you. God is in there with you. God is standing with you. God is guiding you. God is leading you. Because that's what he wants. That's what God wants. And as your sister in Christ, I want the best for you.
and the best for you will always be a life that is surrounded covered by god being in all parts of that and we have to remember that god always has our best for us in everything and when god puts down these guidelines and these instructions it's for our best it's never to make life worse for us. it's always for our best you think about you go back to um the, you know the garden of eden god didn't want them to eat the apple because he knew what it was going to mean it meant death separation from god they could eat it but he knew what it meant and he wanted the best for them they had life eternal they had no pain before they ate the apple all things change when they made that decision and the same for us when god tells us don't do this it's all part of that it's all part of him saying i'm saying this because I'm, I'm looking out for you because i'm concerned for you because i love you that's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm saying it. And so for us, it's really kind of thinking about what is God, why is God saying this? Does God really care for me? Does God have, God have no disregard for me? And it says in verse seven, it says, for God has not called us for uncleanliness, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards, not man, but God who gives Holy Spirit to you. God's word and spirit call us to holiness. We all know when we get those promptings of the spirit to sort of nudging us saying, should you be doing this? Should you be saying that? Shouldn't you speak up? And we don't do it, do we? We sometimes ignore it. We reject it. What we're doing then is rejecting God in reality. When God is kind of gently nudging us saying, come on, you know, you know what you need to do here. Come on now. We can't mock God. We can't do that. And that's what we're doing when we decide to participate in gossip. And we've all done it. We've all done it. But all these things are not being holy. It's not acting in a holy way. And the word says, whatever a man sows, he will also reap. If we sow to the flesh in immorality, he will reap corruption. But if we sow to the spirit in holiness, he will reap eternal life. And that's in Galatians. If the way you behave in whatever aspect of your life has nothing to do with your basic relationship to God, then the warnings of God's vengeance about what we do will make no sense. But it makes sense, and it, so it, then it will make no sense when, um, when Paul says in Romans 8, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But you see, if you don't think there's any connection to how you behave, then you're not gonna think, you're gonna think that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't, I don't care about that statement. But, you know, and so you'll think then when, when he also said in Corinthians, if we must put on the, we must, we must not put the Lord to test. As some of the Israelites did, we destroyed by sin. We think, well, it doesn't make sense. God's not going to really come back and do anything to us. But that's what God's word says. And that's scary. And we don't like to talk about God being vengeful. But if we don't speak truthfully, then actually we're giving half the truth. Because when God is doing something that is normally because he's trying to get us back on track, we see that so many times when you read the Old Testament where God tried to tell them, don't do this, and they did the opposite. And then, he, then, you know, then they did get punished. Not because he's a God that wants to punish, but he's trying to get them back on track. And time and time again, his grace, his grace, his grace, his grace came back to them. He brought them, sorry, brought them back to themselves. He brought them back each time. That's what he did because of his love because he cares so for us we have to think about are we willing to keep on ignoring god's word in that way let no man transgress his brother and wrong his brother because god is avenger in these things as he warned us before our behavior does matter our behavior to our salvation does matter. And as the word says, we'll be known by our fruit. And we can't say we're of God if we deliberately do things that go against his word. But the other thing I think is really important is God is a God of love. So this, although he talks about this holiness lifestyle, it's also about love and it's a loving lifestyle. And love 
that is demonstrated in practical ways will spread out to others. God shows us love and how we interact with one another, how we support one another when we're struggling is how we can all show our love to one another. We're all going to go through situations that are going to make it, you know, where we're not, you know, we might fall off the path and we can get back again. I remember somebody um, coming to me and wanted prayer um, in her, for her marriage because she was attracted to somebody that she worked with. And we spend a lot of time at work with people. We used to when we were in the office and things. She loved her husband, but they were going through a lot of financial and different things that were going on. And she wanted, and she, and she didn't know what, and she, and she was scared she would do something stupid. And I remember giving him a dictate to her, you, you got my number. If you're out and you think I might do something stupid, call me, just call me. Because we need to stand with one another and we can all go through different things and it's being there. So that she knew that she could just pick up the phone and say, I'm having a wobble. And all you got to, and all I had to say to her was, don't you think you should just go home now? <laughs> it's as simple as that, but it's being there. And it's praying for that person and supporting that person, not condemning them, but loving them, supporting them, walking through, through with them. Because there's all gonna be different things that we're gonna, that we will face, that we will struggle with. And it's showing that love and support. God does not condemn and neither should we condemn, but we should stand and support one another, help each other through the, the different things that we face. And it's gonna, everyone's gonna have different things. And I remember when I was sort of pondering this and looking at this this week, I was thinking, why is this, you know, it's like, you know, why is this, why is there such a big focus in this chapter by Paul on sexual immorality? Um, and the obvious, and, and, the, and, and I thought, the, you know, the, the real answer is, is because that's, we often try to put sexual immorality as the worst sin ever, but actually sin is sin. And for me, what I felt he was saying is, you think you're above this, but actually it's really been equated to how you are in this, is how you are in all sorts. It, how you are with this, it's how you are in anything. It doesn't matter what the, what the issue is in your life, they're all equal. And so if you think sexual immorality is bad, oh, I would never commit adultery. Actually, there's something else you might be doing that's equal to adultery. And that's why I think there's a focus on it in this, in this passage compared to maybe some other passages in God's word. He's saying sin is sin. They're all equal. There's no difference. And we shouldn't try to put some things on a pedestal, try to think this isn't so bad. They're all the same. And it's so easy and I've seen it or you hear it and people, um, you know, they talk negatively about this person did this or this has happened. I've been in churches, well, I know of churches, so I've not been in the church, but I've heard of churches where if someone, I mean, just thinking of um, the, the carol from uh, Brooklyn Town Choir, where they would drag a, a girl in the front of the church because she fell pregnant and she had to apologize to the church. That's not love. Support, stand with the person, yes. But doing that, that's not love to that person. You stand with them, you walk with them. There's people I've heard of in churches where they've got divorced and then they've, the church is, in, is stopped talking to them. That's not love. And we have to show that love and not condemn. There's all sorts of reasons things happen in people's lives and we need to be there to support one another, to stand with one another. That's what Thessalonians is about as well. It's that love. Love for one another is so important because God loves us and God forgives us. God knows our thoughts. He knows our heart, but he still loves us. He still reaches out to us. He's still, as we heard in the song earlier, faithful to us. Despite what we might do, when we might reject him, he doesn't reject us. He's still there. And for me, that's one of the things that comes out of it as well with Thessalonians, is what he's trying to talk about. And he's also saying to us that we need to just remember that we've got to still think about how we can support and serve one another to continue the bigger work. Holiness is a tricky thing for to talk about. People say don't like it often and they're uncomfortable with holiness because 
None of us feel that, you know, we're, we're never holy enough. And also sometimes we feel if we talk about being holy, then it's something superior or a separatist attitude. And it isn't. That's not what it's meant to be about. It's not that at all. It's not that we should be feeling that we are superior to others or we need to live separate. That's not what it is. Holiness is throughout the Bible from the beginning to the end of the Bible. We see it. It's where, where it was there when God made his first covenant with Israel to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation in Exodus. The life of people of God is to reflect God's own character. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's what it says in Leviticus, and that's for us as well. And the, the regulations and the laws in Leviticus remind us of that. Holiness is, is, it should, is touching all areas of our lives, not just the religious ones. It shouldn't be that holiness um, means that we are removed from the world, but actually presupposes that we'll be daily living in the world. And that holiness is not to, you know, for the privileged few, but it's for all God's people. None of us should feel that we can't be holy or someone is more holy. You know, you know those expressions like a holy huddle. I, I don't like those expressions because shouldn't, we shouldn't be talking like that because we shouldn't be holy huddles in that sense. We're all to be holy and we're all called to be holy and we all can be holy. It's not for the elite few in churches, it's for all of us. It's not if you think about and what we talk about in this day and age, we, you know, with um, different, um, you know, like the, the training, it's not privatised. It's not a privatised experience, it's for us all. We're all bound up living in community and that means living in community, being holy together, supporting one another and standing with one another. One of the... Um, uh, one of the commentaries I read, um, Michael Gorman, and he talks about um, 1 Thessalonians, um, it, it, it's, it, when he talks about becoming the gospel, um, he says, what seems to be the case is that the Thessalonian believers not only believed, but also embodied and shared the gospel. They did so not merely in their tight-knit community, but in the world, among their friends, relatives, associates, and so on. It seems highly likely then that the Thessalonian believers bore public witness to their faith, love and hope by what they did and did not do and how they interpreted what they did and did not do in various venues. He says, holiness is not withdrawal from the world as some might think, rather it's a kind of participation in the world in a radically new and different way. So the exhortation for a countercultural sexual and work ethic is not just a call to be different for the sake of difference, but a plea for a life that pleases God with an eye on the missional effect of a God-centered approach to sex and work within the context of love for fellow believers and involvement in the wider world. For us, I do believe that God is speaking to us and challenging us as part of his preparing us for what's gonna happen when we come out the other side of COVID, he wants us to really look at ourselves and say, are we reflecting his character? And part of his character is being holy. I believe all this, all this that we're going through for COVID, not that God created, but he's actually speaking to the church and saying to us, I want you to be holy like I am holy. I want you to love one another as I love you. I want you to come back to me in a new way, in a way that separates you in the right way of separation because he's preparing us for something bigger and greater. And I believe the reason why this passage is important at this time, it's all part of that preparation for what is to come. We need to be able to reflect him so that we can draw those that don't yet know him to him. That is what he's asking. That's what he's calling for us to do at this time. Be holy as he is holy because the world will look to us. They are looking to us. How we respond, how we behave is what's going to make the difference for those that don't yet know him. I'm not saying it's always easy and it isn't on our own easy for us, but with him and in him, we can do all things. Nothing is impossible for God. There may be things that we feel, well, I know I've not been quite right in that area. Take it to God. 
that's what we've got to do. There may be things we're not quite sure about maybe that we're doing, but ask God and let him guide and direct us. So to me, the call is for us to be true Christian holiness. And this means in everything, how we are at work, how we behave at work, how we interact with work, in all parts, our relationships that we have. This is what God is saying to us. Be holy. Set yourselves apart in that way, and it will be countercultural, and some people will question it, but that's what God is calling us to do. And I believe we can do it. Supporting one another, standing with one another, reading God's word, allowing God's word to wash over us. We can do this with each other. And it can become more practical than we feel as we start to more get into what God is saying to us and what God is trying to share, a bit, um, to reveal to each of us individually. We need to be there for one another, support one another, because that's how we're then going to reach out to those that don't know yet, yet know him. We are a missional community. We are meant to be out there reaching out to those that don't yet know the Lord. We are. We're going to be spending time, maybe not all of us right now, in, the, in offices, some of us, but we are spending time with our, with our work colleagues. And that's where we need to show the holiness as well. Not just on a Sunday when we're all together, we act holy, but actually when we're out there as well. With our families. And we all know it's our families who see the real side of us, isn't it, right? They know when we're really reflecting who we should be or when we're not. They're the ones that know when we get angry and scream and shout or not. They're the ones that see that. I'm not saying we're not going to be doing that. Of course, we do. that's, that's what I'm saying. But it's actually they know our, that, that character that not everyone sees. But God does see. And God is trying to encourage us in a positive way to become more like him. I'm just going to um, play a song. And while I'm playing the song, I just, just let's reflect on what God might be saying to us individually and really think about that and see what God might be saying to you and what might he, and what, where he might be guiding you, directing you to go as well or what you need to sort of think about. And I don't know what that is. It's going to be deep, different for each, each of us. You know what God might be saying to you. I can't tell you that. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, that you've called us out of darkness into your marvellous light and set us free from slavery to sin and release us, release us from bondage to fear, from bondage to fear. Heavenly Father, your word commands us to be holy as you are holy. And we know that in and of ourselves, we cannot live in true holiness of heart, except as the Lord Jesus lives his life in us. And the Holy Spirit carries out a life transforming work in us. Thank you that we've been born into your family, united together with Christ and then one with him. I pray that increasingly his nature and character may be developed in us and until we can say as Paul did, my old self has died and been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives his resurrection life in me and works through me. Lord, we come to you incapable of being able to live a holy life ourselves and humbly ask you, Lord, that you would teach us to be holy and show us how you would, live, have, how you would have us live. Open our eyes to see what you would have to do. Unlock our ears so that we may hear your still small voice and give us a teachable spirit to learn all that you would teach us. We know that we alone can do nothing but in Christ, who is our life, and we can do all things in Jesus' name. Thank you for breathing the new resurrection life of Christ into our, every, our very being, and for taking up permanent residence within our hearts. Lord, we want to be led by your Holy Spirit and to walk in spirit and truth. We want to live a godly life and to develop personal holiness, but we do not know really how to. We ask that you would continue to root out all of, from all of us that 
that counters what you desire from us. We pray that you would increasingly transform us into the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus day by day. Lord, I know this is not an easy prayer for us to pray. And it may cause pain sometimes for what might happen when we pray these things. But Lord, I believe that this is the will for each of your children. And so we come to you today and say, Father, your will be done in our lives. Give us, Lord, I pray, that desire and grace to become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, to your praise and glory. This I ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>